Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Uh, following the screening of Nomadland, I'm delighted to be welcome live from America, the no novelist Jessica Bruder. Um, and hopefully, you can see some of the audience, Jessica. Wow. And <laughs> everybody's everybody's waving. Um, and also Andrew Kelly, director of Bristol Ideas. Um, so what it remains for me to do is just to hand over to Andrew um, and you'll be, you'll be live on the big screen. You'll be live on my computer as well, Andrew, to introduce Jessica. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And, and hello everyone in Watershed and, and hello everyone online. It's an honor to be hosting this event with Jessica Bruder, uh, author of Nomadland. Um, I first read Nomadland when it came out in 2017, and I read it again this week. And it's a book that makes you angry. It makes you fearful about the future, not just uh, for the United States, but also for places like the United Kingdom. But it's a book that gives you some hope too. Um, I'm gonna be talking with Jess. Um, we're gonna take as many questions as we can. Do submit any questions you'd like to see asked via text message, as I think the instruction has gone out to the, uh, the audience in Watershed. Uh, and in the chat, and I'll try and, and, and spot as many uh, as I can. Uh, but but let, Jess, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from, from Brooklyn. Thanks for having me. This is the first time I have kind of been in a theater where Nomadland was happening. Uh, I hope to actually see it in the theater at some point, but I'm glad you all are there and a little jealous. And uh, I thank you for being there too. And you have seen the film though, obviously, haven't you? You, you saw no, it as a drug. No, <laughs> I'm waiting on it. Yes. So it's sort of to drive you. What, what, did, what, what, what did you think when you saw it for the first time? The first time I saw it was actually in quarantine on my couch where I am now. Uh, and it was a near final cut that wasn't final. And I wasn't supposed to tell anyone I'd seen it. And I, uh, I choked up a lot. And I mean, it, I'm not a very objective viewer of the film, I'll tell you, because they're in the places and with the people I spent about a decade of my life reporting with. So uh, it, it's funny, I, I have to kind of take off my journalist hat here and realize I'm just watching it as a person and having reactions to these experiences that feel at once so familiar. Um, yeah, I, I loved it. I love the tone of it. Um, I love the poetry of it. And again, for me, just seeing Linda, Bob, Swanky, the guy who hugs Fran's character in the first scene, who I've known for a decade, seeing them all up there and I think really doing a fantastic job and thinking about how we tend to limit people who are older and we get these ideas that only certain people do certain things and you don't get to try new things after a certain point. Uh, that brought me a really specific sort of joy to, to see them doing that, so. And as, as I saw the, I read the book and then I saw the film, yesterday at the theatre, thank you, Watershed. And then I read the book again and I, I thought that, I mean, it's often you know, turning a book into a film is, is not the easiest of tasks because you know, you'd, you'd have a film which is 18 hours long if you did everything. But I thought that it, quite a remarkable job was achieved actually, particularly with the people that you've mentioned and also many others that, that you, you came across who appeared in the film in different ways, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and my hope, uh, in terms of uh, doing the terrifying thing, which is kind of handing something off and, and letting go, is that it would capture the spirit rather than stalk the book to the letter, because as we know, film and nonfiction literature are very different categories. And I don't think slavishly following the book would have made for the best film. Um, but I do think as a composite character, Fern works really well. And I love the way she acts as a docent, kind of taking us through this world that it was my great honor to map out during my time on the road. Now, let's, let's talk about the book. You, you, you've been with this book, you know, I was trying to work out when you actually started on it, but it's, it's like a decade, isn't it now, really? Yeah, and I, I, I didn't even realize it when I was first talking about that, because things that weren't supposed to be a part of the book, um, like, for example, Empire, which I'm obsessed with and have been for a long time, uh, I, I ended up being able to bring them in, uh, even though I couldn't connect them the way the film did. Um, and that research began in 2011. So it hasn't been a straight shot through a decade. I've, I've done a lot of other stuff, but, but yeah, it really has been with me that long. And you, you became a nomad 
yourself, didn't you? You you bought a van and you went to work in some of these places. Uh, well, I call it a FOMAD. Uh, that's my <laughs> really horrible pun because I feel like one of the re really important things about immersion journalism is recognizing that you're an insider and an outsider at the same time, that you're not trying to actually become the people you're documenting, because I think a, that's a little narcissistic and B, it's just not true. I mean, I was always coming back here uh, to my apartment in Brooklyn. You know, the first time I was out, I was out there for two months. Uh, and then I came back and acclimating was super, super weird. So um, yeah, for me, immersion is just kind of stepping out and stepping in and, and trying to see something from standing on both sides of the line. And, and what, what, start, what, what triggered your interest in, in, this, in, the, in the subject? Yeah, well, I, I first heard about Amazon's Camper Force program. And growing up in the Northeast, I had, I had very specific associations with what RVs were and what they meant. Um, I know in places they call them caravans. Here we call them RVs, recreational vehicles. And I always assumed that people were using them exclusively to recreate. Um, so when I saw older people in them, I figured, oh, you know, uh, there go the last of the great pensioners, they are seeing Niagara Falls, they're going to Yellowstone, they are, uh, you know, basically on a permanent vacation. How cool is that? And uh, when I learned about Amazon's Camper Force program, I, I remember reading one specific story where it was just a side mention. Nobody had done a deep exploration and somebody uh, talked to a writer and said, oh yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm part of, uh, I'm working at this Amazon warehouse for the season. I live in an RV full time and I'm doing this because I can't afford to retire. And that really gave me a jolt. Oh, and there's a whole program for people like us. And I said, there's a whole program? And that really got me curious. And when I started researching and learning that there were all these other jobs, some of them we see in the film, the sugar beet harvest, the campground hosting, um, hundreds more, uh, doing Christmas tree stands, doing firework sales, working at theme parks, uh, this just seemed like this whole shadow economy going on all over America that I didn't know anything about. And that's where it started. That and, and what, what kind of size is it, do you think? I mean, it's difficult to guess, say, I guess, but, but you, know, um, you know, have you got any idea of numbers? It's, it's an audience question we've had. Yeah, you know, it really depends on how you define it. First of all, are we just talking about people who are full-time on the road or are we talking about the demographic in the book where it's people who can't really afford to retire and are at or nearing traditional retirement age and working. Uh, and that could put us tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, but unfortunately there is no survey. Um, everybody I met needs to maintain some sort of street address. It might be a mail forwarder, it might be a friend, uh, but they need to hide in plain sight because that's how our culture works. So there's really no way to determine exactly how many, that, that isn't anecdotal. So, you know, I say that, but it's not science. And, and there's many different reasons, aren't there, why people have um, gone on the road. You know, the, the financial crash was obviously quite a, a trigger, but, you know, you, you talk about, you know, people, people still, still, still pay personal crises that sometimes hit people, uh, no jobs um, or jobs elsewhere. I mean, one thing that I really... There are many, many things I like about this, you know, wonderful and terrific book, Jess. And one of them is about the nuance of this, really, about the, the way, you know, because you, you kind of think of these people sometimes as victims and so on, but they're not. They come across very differently. I think the film did that very well, actually. I was really pleased with that, too, because it was very important for, that too. Um, for me not to portray them as victims. They don't see themselves as that way. And I really believe that part of dignity is agency. And when we deny that to people and don't show... Uh, the full expression of who they are and what they're doing, um, it can be patronizing, frankly. So I, I do believe that we're all impacted by these economic forces, by things like flat wages and rising rents. And we chart, people chart different paths through these economic absurdities. So um, I'm, I'm glad that registered with you. I, I think it's great if we can kind of hold these two things that are in some ways in conflict, but not try to resolve them because we respect our readers and we respect our viewers. and we want them to do the same kind of wrestling with it that we do, rather than just pre-digesting it and vomiting it up like a mommy bird feeding a, a fledgling or something gross like that. Sorry, it's springtime. It's what can I, I mean, say? It's what's happening in springtime. It's um, the, the the you know Linda. I always said the character of Linda May, but of course it's a it's a re, Linda is a real person as well as being a, in the film and so on. But 
you really be really quite root for her, don't you, in terms of you know the her plans for the 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 the, the, the kind of what she wants to create out there uh, in in that space she's trying to build something in. Yes, I, and I as a joke, I, I, I used to think about making T-shirts that said "I'm with Linda May." Um, because I, I'm still rooting for Linda May. Uh, I've gotten attached to her. I don't know that we're supposed to do that as journalists, but uh, you know, if anybody had told either of us when I met her out in the desert in 2014 that I would be following her for three years for a book and then it would get picked up for a film and she'd be starring alongside Frances McDormand, we would definitely want to know what you were smoking. Uh, it, it just seems so wild. So uh, it's a joy to still have her in my life. But there's a lovely quote from her I read on Instagram, actually, how delighted she is about all, all of this. And, and for you as well, Jess, I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what you and the others have achieved with this, this film and this book. Yeah, Linda's Thanks. one of the things, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, carry on, carry on. One of the lovely things I saw Linda say in the press was, my mom always told me to say yes when you're invited to the party, which cracked me up because when I was out there by myself with my notepad, uh, there were people who were pretty skeptical about having a journalist around. And Linda was one of the most open-hearted people I met. And, and now I feel like I understand where she was coming from just a little bit more. And just on the, on the, just following up some of the questions that we've had, um, and, and also I was going to ask this myself about um, the, the makeup of, of the nomadic. And, you know, obviously it's quite hard to, to generalize, but is it predominantly white and, and is it predominantly middle class? Um, economically, it's a little more diverse. Racially, it's not very diverse, uh, although I think it's diversifying a bit. Uh, there, are, there are some efforts to diversify the RVing community, and I think that's really starting with the more prosperous segments of the RVing community, uh, but that may well trickle down. Um, I think part of this is it is hard in America to travel while Black or Brown. Uh, you know, when I was writing the book, we had headlines that felt like every week with a police officer shooting an unarmed motorist. I also was spending a lot of time uh, near the U.S. border with Mexico, and they have these checkpoints that are supposed to be border checkpoints, but they're actually several miles inland. And just driving through them and getting hustled along as a white person, just yeah, lady, go through, just makes me wonder how they decide who to stop and what it would mean to be Latinx uh, doing that same drive. So I think that's part of it. No. Another impression you get from the book and the film is the sheer amount of hard work it takes when you when you are you know one of these camper force people or particularly the sugar beet uh, details and so on and how exhausting that that all, all must be and there, there's been um, a, a lot of the focus or some of the focus in the book is on is on Amazon and that's slightly less in the film. I mean, what, 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 have you got any views on that? Do you, do you think that the film underplayed the Amazon issue? I mean, there are so many things that one could take from the book that again, if I was rooting for my own darlings, <laughs> I mean, we all know how I feel about Amazon if, if you've read the book or kind of seen anything I've written. Um, but again, I'm not the filmmaker here. And what I dreamed of was that we'd end up with a, a fictional story that remained true to the spirit of the book. And I really believe that the film did that. Did I expect the film to be investigative journalism? No. Uh, do I hope that when people check out the film, they will take a deeper inter interest in these issues? Absolutely. I did a short documentary called Camper Force with a filmmaker named Brett Story, which is still visible online. Um, and yeah, I'm excited because in the US, like it or not, we are more of a movie culture than a book culture. So in my mind, if, if any of this can draw more attention to the issues, it's great. Uh, I think a lot of people want me to be pissed off that there's not more Amazon or that they're not hitting Amazon with a baseball bat in the movie. Um, and there's been some controversy over that in the US. And it's a little bit frustrating because I think about when people are freaking out about representation of Amazon in the film, that we could also just be talking about Amazon issues in, in that space rather than representation issues. And I feel like sometimes the left becomes a bit of a circular firing squad. Uh, in that way. So I, I hope we can not gaze at our navels and actually talk mm. about real labor issues mm. instead. Now, one of the things that um, as you as you head back home in the book is is you see you see van dwellers in your own area of Brooklyn. I mean, we have 
van dwellers in Bristol as well. Um, and, and in fact, our mayor re, uh, over the past uh, few months has been trying to find more permanent sites for people to, uh, currently they're, they're, they're on the streets. I mean, is this something that most of us don't tend to see? Or is it, you know, now that you've written this book and I've read it, I, I probably will see more of this and so on. Um, but, but I'm just interested in, in, in what you think the scale of the problem is, not, not in the places you visited and worked in, but, but in your home area of Brooklyn as well. Oh, it's growing. It's definitely growing. I, I think there are two things happening at once. I think I noticed more of it because I know the tactics that people use to do what we call stealth parking or stealth camping uh, to keep out of the eyes of the authorities uh, while doing this. And also, I just think there are more people doing it. So it's a combination. Um, I was also in Los Angeles not long ago, and the population of people doing it out there has just exploded. Yeah. Um, so again, I just think, you know, the book came out in 2017. So we are talking about a moving picture. Uh, and I think this stuff is only growing. Uh, and that growth is across some different demographics as well. Mm. One, I'm getting quite a lot of questions now, and, and we're not going to be able to take them all, I'm afraid. But I wanted to ask one of them, um, which is about... Um, I read about van dwelling in the New Yorker. I can't remember when it was, but there was this rather romantic article about van dwelling, and um, and it, it linked to this is a, is an interesting question about the kind of romanticism about living on the road, particularly in terms of popular culture. And I thought it was very interesting in the book how um, you are you talk about Steinbeck and the Oakies and the Grapes of Wrath and so on. But actually, the book that you're recommended to read by Steinbeck is Travel. The, the travels with Charlie, the, the dog. Um, but do you think this issue, do you think this kind of romanticism stops any kind of action on this kind of issue? Mm, yes and, and no. I mean, in terms of action on the issue, a lot of people I met out there doing these hard jobs. So for example, a common question I got was, well, why don't the camper force people unionize? And I'm thinking, when do you expect them to unionize? Is it after the totally grueling shift when they're soaking their feet in Epsom salts or when they're sleeping it off? Do you know what I mean? I think it's a little uncharitable to think that all the work needs to fall on their shoulders. Um, and in terms of hashtag van life, um, it, it's funny, that started coming out in the press Gosh, I think I was either almost done with the book. I forget what year that infamous uh, New Yorker story came out. But I've often looked at van life as more of a brand than a movement. Uh, and it's connected to the rise of Instagram influencers and people hoping they can get by uh, by having a personal brand and sponsors and all that stuff. And, and we all know that for everyone who is actually doing that, there are probably thousands of aspirants um, who are actually having a tough time. And I think, at least in the US, we don't like talking about fashion and the economy in the same breath, but all these themes are intertwined. We can talk about, yay, minimalism is great, but what if we talk about how income inequality might be shaping some of that aesthetic, aesthetic? because it's way cooler to talk about chic minimalism than poverty, uh, you know, and student debt and low wages. And I think all of these things actually do intertwine uh, in a way that we ignore at our peril. And that when you think about some of the really big issues that cause this, you know, the, the, the breakdown of the, the intergenerational social contract, you know, so-called, you know, where, you know, certainly throughout my life, I've always believed that the generations will, that follow will become wealthier and better than, than, than the ones that, that went before, really. And that, that's frankly broken now. Um, and, um, and that's the result of that is, is the kind of things that you're, you're writing about. But, but, the big question I always think about this is, is how do we provide a future for people? You know, how do we provide something which gives them hope and a belief in a future? Sure, I, I mean, I think the fact that we're not doing that well right now is just indicated by how many people I met on the road who are almost uh, what I would consider post-political, which is a little scary. The, the attitude sometimes in terms of who's in power is really same hand, different puppet. Uh, nobody's expecting the cavalry to come and help. And it's a shame uh, because in the US at least, we are the most unequal nation among the so-called developed world. Uh, that's not a politicized statement. There's something called the Gini index, which accounts for income inequality. It's even used by the CEA to assess the stability of nations. 
uh, so we have a lot of problems. We have a huge problem in the in the states with monopolies right now, and uh, labor power really being in the tank. And Biden has made a lot of talk about pushing us out of that and hopefully uh, igniting what we might call a new New Deal, which would be great. I just don't know if it's going to happen or not. Um, and we'll see. I think our social safety net is really threadbare. And I worry when people on the right talk about, you know, gutting social security and stuff like that, when I think instead we really need to be shoring it up. Uh, we need, you know, in the States, we have people doing GoFundMes and Facebook fundraisers for medical that, that, that tells us obviously that something broken. So many of the people I met had to cross the border into Mexico just to get dental care. In the US, we don't even consider your eyes and your teeth as part of your body. Most medical insurance, it, it's the most absurd thing. Um, it's as if they're little satellites floating away. Um, so there are so many things we need to do. I mean, and obviously one of the things we need to deal with is have a minimum wage that's also a living wage. We have a huge problem with that. And the divergence between wage and housing is a huge thing. We have a long way to go on uh, treating housing and healthcare as a human right. I mean, I could just go on and on. It's a pretty big picture. I've just been told we better start winding up, which is uh, we could have gone on for a long time, Jess. And um, but, but I wanted to ask you just one other thing, really, which is about what's happened since. And obviously, we can't talk about it all. But I, I looked up um, Empire, the place that where it starts, and um, and, and there seems to be a slight opening up there um, in terms of the, the plant getting back to work a little bit, but certainly by no means the scale uh, that it was and the, the level of employment that it, that it offered. Oh, absolutely. And it's funny because the plant is operating, but at the same time, there are places that have that Chernobyl time stopped feel. Um, you know, we see Brown's character Fern walking through that tract house at the end. I remember I was there when people were moving out, when people had kind of been dispossessed and the fence hadn't gone up yet and those houses weren't falling apart. So for me, that was emotional. Um, what else can I update you on? There's a lot. Just on, on Linda May was the other one. I mean, oh, I, Linda, I she... Linda um, bought land in Taos with some of the money she made from being a killer actress, who knew? And um, she's homesteading and she is really excited about that. She is not doing an earthship anymore, not because she can't, but because she realized, you know, she's in her early seventies now, that would take a couple of years. And uh, she's not into that. She would rather show hospitality to her family and the people she cares about. Uh, I think she's more into the people side of her life than taking on this gigantic project. So, so that's where she is and, she, and she's happy. Well, I'm sorry, we weren't able to get to all of the questions. We, we have to end it there. Um, thank you, Watershed, for hosting this with us at Bristol Ideas. Uh, there's a question from Judith in the chat, which asked whether this would be archived. It, it will be available on both our website and on the Watershed website. I think from Tuesday uh, is, is, is when it will be placed on, the, on, the, on both uh, of the websites. It's good to see everything back open, and especially Watershed and showing brilliant films like Nomadland. Do read the, this terrific and important book. It's published here by Swift Press and available, as they say, from all good bookshops and online from our partners at Waterstones. Both Watershed and uh, Bristol Ideas have more events and films coming up. Do check our website for details. And thank you again all for coming. And most of all, thank you to Jess Bruder for joining us uh, today. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you, Andrew, Bristol Ideas and Watershed. It's, it's great to be in your theatre. I hope to be in another one soon. It's, it's really cool, though, and I'm, I'm glad and to. And Next we hope time you'll, um, you, you can come to Bristol some point, Jess, as well. Oh, yes. Put me on a plane. I'm there. <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks very much. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>